How's it going, guys? Welcome back to the Blue Shitting, and welcome back to the House of Father Morgana. Uh, I guess it's reincarnation, but also it's technically like Revenant Stream or something like that. That's what the collection's called, I suppose. But yeah, we're back. We're doing it again. Last night, last time we did uh, Boy Meets Girl and Silent Night, Lonely Night, which were great. It's cute little stories, and I'm really excited to be able to kind of be sharing more of this with you all. Um, but yeah, we're gonna see how far we can go because the we're, we're definitely in the like shorter story section It looks like but of course who knows well, I, I'll find out when we get there So we're gonna do starlet coffee house Hopefully a ghost of an excuse and we'll hopefully be able to get started in some of these as well um, And then of course going back and finishing off with revenant stream before we get into the meat and potatoes of this series So hope you guys are enjoying yourselves. Hope you guys are uh, kicked back relax and just you know catch this with me and enjoy it I, I look forward to being able to share it with you as I always do but I mean I can't say it enough. It's a pleasure. So, hope you guys are having a good time, and let's get started. Okay. Ooh. Seems like it's my Jokopo story. Um. Uh, <clears throat> you... Now tell me, my boy, how are your things going on your end? Asked Jokopo's good friend, chest puffed and hand stroking a triangular beard. He wasn't sure how he was supposed to react. Annoyed, confused, disappointed, or as if he just stumbled upon a mythical creature. Can I take your silences poorly? Are we really going to do this? Jacopo finally managed to get out. But not without a heavy sigh, which uh, created ripples in the two cups on the coffee of, the, of, of coffee on the table between them. What are you even doing here, Maria? Yes, he was sitting across from his oldest friend and very much a woman. Scarlet in the coffee house. What does it look like? I'm having a cup of coffee, thank you very much. Maria tilted her head, still st stroking the fake beard. Oh, so she's pretending to be a guy, gotcha. She had lowered her voice a few registers, but Jacopo could still recognize it as hers without much difficulty. No, I mean coffee houses are men's establishments. What are you doing here? They were sitting in a far corner away from most of the other customers. At the same time, the coffee house where social gatherings take a uh, place for men, where they talked news, gossip, business, or anything else of interest. And for an investor like Jacopo, it was a crucial part of how he did business. He had come here today to scout out opportunities, but those plans fell by the wayside when he caught sight of the small framed man with the slick black, slicked back blonde hair. She, so he approached her and confirmed his suspicions that it was Maria in men's clothing. Why else would I be dressed like this, Doi? Please don't tell me you've been weaseling your way into this place before. Weaseling isn't a very nice way to put it. But no, no need for you to get your panties in a bunch. This is just the first time. Heck, half the reason I did this was to startle you, because I thought you'd be here today. Jacobo had many questions. So many, in fact, he wasn't sure where to begin. <laughs> where had she gotten these clothes and the flake hair, fake beard, for one? Wouldn't the other maids get upset at her if they found out she was here? And why had she gone to such lengths just to surprise? Hold on, you said half the reason. What's the other half? Because I wanted some coffee, doy. You have coffee at the mansion. I know we're not out of beans. That's not the point, Jacopo. It's not the point. <laughs> That's not the point, stupid. Coffee at the coffee house is a completely different thing. It's about the experience. And speaking of it, it kind of sucks. It's a really sausage party in here. That was more surprising to him than her being here. That she didn't like it here because there were only men. In his mind, and in society's eyes for that matter, that was simply what coffee houses were, and he'd never considered that the potential detriment as a potential detrimental. Assuming some other maid had said the same thing to him, Jacopo probably would have lectured her about the role of men and women in modern society and how it wasn't her place to judge men's spaces. But he considered Maria too much of a friend and an equal, and far enough detached from the con con from the convention, that at that he could. That at that, that he couldn't bring himself to do that to her. That's a lot of that. So. He also had no idea how to effectively communicate that sentiment to her. Anyway, please don't be going stunts like this too often. I don't want to catch any blowback. It's fine, no one caught me. Well, I caught you, Jacopo thought. Not to mention the curious glances they'd been getting this entire time he was here. 
If he hadn't found her when he did, chances are she would have been thrown out by now. Oh, hey, Maria said, her eyes going wide. She thought she then gave him a wink. Not unusual for her, but it looked very out of place on this not quite there, there quite there gentleman -like look she was sporting. Next time I want to go, you come with me. You're like the big name investor Jacopo. No one's going to want to get on your bad side just because you brought a chick. Excuse me. This is a place for doing business. Also, don't call me that. You can do all the business you want. I listen to your talks, and when we get back, I give you my thoughts. You know, I'm sharp. I'm sure I could be of help. He wasn't sure if she was serious or just pulling his chain again, but since she wasn't laughing, he decided to assume the former. So you'd be a second pair of eyes, then. You know, that's not half a bad idea, he said with a chuckle. Marie's eyes went wide. What? I've always counted on you, you know that. Right. <laughs> You're making me blush. Having Marie at his right-hand man would be the best for him in the long term. She was the only person he was able to really trust in this world. Oh, oh the irony. But it would take a lot of work to make that possible. He would need to, even more money, more power, and more status. Enough to resist the pressures he would undoubtedly get from all sides. Jacopo was the heir of the Ber uh, Berazzetti family. And Maria was the sole survivor of the Capanella family. There were still countless obstacles to putting her on the same stage as him. But in a week's time, I'll be taking the first step, he thought, tilting his head back toward the ceiling. That was when Jacopo's bride-to-be was scheduled to reach the new world. Hey, Jacopo. What is it? We'll always be like this, won't we? Maria asked, looking stern in a way he almost never saw her. But before he could answer, Yeah, of course we will. We'll never change. Oh, it, yeah, of course we will. We'll never change. She said as if she needed some reassurance. Was that really all it was? Dang! A few more like that, we'll be done. With, we'll be ready for the main main event a lot sooner. No, super sweet and super quick. That's interesting. So I definitely got some of the voice lines off. It's hard to tell when it's like just the quotes, you know. It'd be nice if they changed color or something just to help me indicate like. To help indicate to me who's talking, but eh, it's not a huge deal. All right, let's start a ghost of an excuse. Oh, fetch! Hang on. Dang it. This happened last time, too. I wonder if my PlayStation's having issues, because it crashed last time. All right, let's try again. Okay, that time I seem to work. A ghost of an excuse. I saw a ghost, Giselle said as she entered my bedchamber. She was wearing night clothes, and the feeble light of the candle in her hand made her look more pouty than scared. I thought you didn't believe in ghosts or anything like that. What do you want me to say? I saw what I saw. And that was supposed to be convincing? Are you sure it wasn't something else? I'm positive. There was a white figure going all woo at me in the hall. With each ooh, ooh she took another step toward me until she was close enough to grab me by the collar and throw me to the ground. Why did she seem angry at me and not the white figure hooting, hooing at her in the corridor? So what do you want from me then? D don't make me spell everything out. Uh, <laughs> come on, come on. <laughs> what did she expect from me? She knew I wasn't very adept at reading people. How was I supposed to know what she wanted? She wants cuddles, boy. Come on. Wait, slow down. It wasn't good to give up without giving any thought. I needed to at least attempt to reason out what she might have been thinking. One, she wanted me to exercise the ghost. Ah, <laughs> oh, gee. Two, she thought I was the ghost. Three, she wanted more light in the mansion. One's not reasonable. How am I supposed to exercise something that doesn't exist? Two's out the question. And there's only so much I can do about three with my supply of candles. What are you going on about? Crap. Oh, what are you what are you going on about? Crap, I've been thinking out loud. She stared up at me for a few seconds before letting out a dramatic sigh. <sighs> the sigh was 98% exasperation and 2% what seemed like almost lust, but I wasn't certain. I, I wanted you to offer to let me sleep with you tonight. I took a good 15 seconds to process what she'd said, after which all I could manage to get out was a flaccid... What? 
Giselle's face was bright red, and I was sure mine was no better. She felt warmer than usual, though, through her night clothes. Oh. I wasn't sure if it was because the fabric was thin or she was just warm. Or maybe it was both. Cover your ears, children! <laughs> Giselle giggled, nuzzling my neck. It was an impressive but quick turnaround for someone who had been pouting at me only a few minutes before. In a way, it felt somewhat like having a dog or cat. At first, we were both nervous, but that quickly melted away, leaving only comfort and warmth. Body heat belonged to neither of us, and both. Sweetness. I never could have imagined a day would come where I welcomed someone else's touch as much as I did hers. We'll get you used to this eventually. Do you really think I'll be able to? Of course. Before you know it, this will be nothing. In some ways, that's kind of sad. Sure, it can be. But the happy will be stronger than the sad. Something becoming every day isn't a bad thing, I don't think. I suppose. She was probably right. Her becoming a natural part of my life was a good thing. But then, the closer she got, the harder it would get to be a part again. In time, would we get close enough to touch that, uh, enough that touch was just a completely normal thing for me? Would I be comfortable touching her arms or her lips? Would I be able to open myself up to her entirely? And would she accept me for who I was? I hope so. To all of it. You're so tall, Michelle. It's wonderful. Why do you say that? Well, I'm the tallest one in my family. My big sister's so small, and she's the most precious thing in the world. I've always wanted, been jealous of her for that. Like she's more of a girl than me. I bet her wedding was absolutely lovely, too. That's, that's a surprise. You're the perfect just the way you are, though. Oh, really? That's not what you said when I first arrived. I've grown, thank you. <laughs> Her breath tickled my neck as she laughed. So I love the way I can just fit entirely in your arms. Sorry I couldn't be a buff for you two. Hey, you're never going to let me live that down, are you? Just a little payback. Boo, she said, looking up at me pouting. Her jade eyes seemed to glimmer even in the dark. They were beautiful. But I would keep that thought to myself. Oh, Wyatt, come on! I didn't want to ruin the moment for what would be sound like a cheap flirting. As this glimmer was worth so much more than that. As she was. As was she. Giselle. Hmm? Giselle, I'm so glad to have you in my life. Good night. Aww. Aww, it's too cute! Ah! Dang, that was so fast! We really might be going through these, like, much, much quicker. Oh, there. It's at the bottom. Okay. Alright, uh, so we've done two, and we're, like, hardly touching this. So, yeah, let's just see how far we can get on this. Like, I'm guessing... Oh, well, here's another parts one and two, so maybe those are gonna be longer, but... Um, this next one, I'm guessing, will also be a shorter one. So, Eternal... Mij misje, misje. Like you're gonna help me. Anyone who knows French at all, please help me. I'm sure I'm horrifically slaughtering this. Oh, it's gonna be about her. Eternal misje, misje. Are you okay, Orlando? A single flower out of place in that den of body odor and booze charged across the pub to the table and back at, to, to, at the back where he sat. She had radiant golden hair, as though she carried the sun itself on her shoulders. All the other men paused their drinking and merrymaking to get a look. The flower was out of breath by the time she reached his table. Orlando was a tall, lanky man with thin eyebrows, hardly what one might have assumed as a, a lady of refined as her would be interested in. And the bandages wrapped around his head, covering one eye, only served to enhance the discount villain image. A man somewhere in the pub let out a whistle. <sighs> Princess and the thief, a match made in hell. Orlando glared over at him for a few moments before the young lady shouted, What happened to you? Directly in his face. Don't shout like that, Philippa. Philippa. Jeez, you're trying to make me, you're trying to make me go deaf? Then tell me what happened. Are you okay? Are you hurt? Will it get better? 
It's no big deal, really. You know what they say, scars and trophies. Oh yeah, you see any good eye patches out in the market today? That's a subtle way to say that you lost your eye. Something black would be great. Real nice and fancy, dress up a bit. Orlando chuckled and shrugged his shoulders. But Philippa's frown only deepened. Do you want people to think you're a pirate and throw you out into the sea? <laughs> Philippa pounded on the table in response. In the sa in a span of about 30 seconds, she'd gone through the entire spectrum of emotion. Sad, angry, upset, worried, disappointed. Listen, Orlando, she said with a sigh. We've been together through our whole lives. Don't you think you should have come to see me first? I've been worried sick ever since I heard how things went in Cassell. So when I saw the soldiers coming back, I just had to know you were okay. Why would you keep me waiting like that? If Philippa was going to be this blunt, Orlando couldn't continue messing around. She stole a chair from somewhere and threw it beside him and dropped down into a, in a single action entirely unbefitting of an upper-class lady. Then she leaned in and said, So? So what? So, tell me all about the Battle of Cassell. In detail. To make up for all the time you made me spend worrying. It's no fairy tale, you know. It's bloody and violent, not to mention it was a losing battle. I still want to know, she said, leaning in even closer, her vivid hazel eyes unflinching. It's about you, of course I want to know. He dropped his shoulders and sighed, feigning defeat. <sighs> Everyone at the pub knew it was just an act, that Orlando had feelings for this enchanting childhood friend of his. In reality, he'd wanted to jump out of his chair and start dancing when she barged in looking for him. His other mercenary companions had caught on quickly to the reason he joined the re and the reason they ne he needed the money, and they watched warmly. There's only one person there who didn't know yet, Philippa herself. But it was only a matter of time. They had been close their whole lives, after all. I can regale you with tales of valor and triumph, but if you insist, Orlando said in a per to preface his account. And then he told her of their battle at the Cassell, of the fallen comrades, of the state of the war. Their homeland was a war with the Western Kingdoms. Battles broke out across the land, and mercenaries were hired and compensated for their lack of soldiers. Orlando grew up in a port town, but instead of becoming a fisher, he decided to take up the sword. His childhood friend, Philippa, chastised him repeatedly, doing everything she could to stop him from going to war. But Orlando was firm in his resolve. His first battle was four years ago, and he was surprised he had survived as long as he did. But now that he'd lost an eye, Orlando figured it was probably time to pack it in. He'd, sh he'd saved up a decent amount of money anyway. Orlando knew Philippa's parents wouldn't approve, but he was sure he had enough to convince them of his love. Besides, because love was the only, was the only second when it came to someone so far beyond your, above your status. Which was why he hadn't become a fisher. Orlando took up the mantle of a mercenary to save enough money to propose marriage to the daughter of a wealthy merchant family. That was what he lived for. A hey, Philippa. Finishing his account of the battle, Orlando straightened himself up in his seat. Philippa raised an eyebrow. Yes, what is it? The soldier at the nearby table started grinning, thinking it was finally time. But he wasn't going to propose to her in a grubby, grungy pub. He was planning to invite her somewhere more fitting when... Greetings, brave warriors, came a booming voice at the door. I celebrate your fine efforts on the battlefield. And to commemorate my crew and I offer you these meager gifts. Orlando clicked his tongue as loud as he could manage. Why the heck did he have to show up now of all times? Standing at the door was, in Orlando's wor words, a yellow-skinned bee whose face looked like a lizard crushed by a pot lid. The man was the captain of a trading vessel that had quickly expanded its business over the past few years. Orlando didn't like him, not only because he was an outsider, but because he had sweet-talked and bought his way into the upper crust. Isn't that what you're planning to do a bit? The man's crew carried barrels of wine into the pub, and every single soldier's face lit up, except Orlando's. He just frowned, trying to make clear he wouldn't be bought so easily. Oh, well, hello there, Philippa. Fancy meeting you here. Seeing the man getting friendly with her just irritated him even more. And then, when he walked over and put his hand on her shoulder, Orlando snapped, kicking his chair back and almost charging at the man. Get your filthy hands off her, you ape. Back off, Philip is mine. We have important things to discuss right now. Get the F out of here, con on. Con man. But Orlando didn't manage to say anything. It really is quite the coincidence. Orlando's jaw dropped. Philippa's cheeks were flushed, her gaze turned toward her feet, her arms held straight down at her center with her fingers interlocking. 
He had never seen her like that before. The rough, pl pushy, unrefined girl he she was for him was because he was just her longtime friend, Flippa. In the four years Orlando had spent saving up to propose, another man, wealthy by birth, had come in and beaten him to the punch. He learned that night it was the ha it was the haves who made for the it was the haves who made the world go round, and the have-nots like him were only along for the ride. <laughs> as much as you may insist otherwise, you really do care, Orlando. Philippa's daughter, Pauline, said with a bright smile. Oh, okay, so Pauline's mom. Gotcha. The many years since that night re relieved Orlando of both his youth and his optimism. I feel bad enough as it is. Please don't take, adva don't take advantage of me, he said, his voice softer and his tone lighter now. With his life's mission ended in failure, Orlando gave up being a mercenary and took up somewhat less exciting work. Sometimes a bodyguard, sometimes just carrying boxes, but never anything terribly life-threatening. I think I might take full advantage of this. Thanks, see you in a bit. Pauline's smile was vibrant, something she got from her mother. Her hair was black like her father's, though. He could see both, the, both the, the, of them in her, and it tore him apart sometimes, dragging him back to his younger days. After watching her scamper off into the village, Orlando turned his head upward toward the sky. Stop thinking about it. Just focus on what you have to do. He needed to convince Pauline that there was nothing to find here, then bring her back home. Philippa would be furious with him. She might even end all association from him for this. But he was not going to let her go off on the search with some, rat for, for, with some stranger and get herself killed. Oh, this is when she's trying to track down the beast. He was the captain that she asked the favor of. He loved her. Oh my gosh. What a convoluted nest. So his only choice was to go himself and then bring her back. Orlando heaved a sigh and headed into the village. He prayed nothing would happen to her. Oh boy, that must have been a very awful reunion after that. Okay. We're going to start A Silence of Sweet uh, Sincerity of Days Long Lost 1. We're going to see how far I get, but since we've already done so many other stories, I'm not going to go too deep into this most likely. So this might be one of the first ones we have to break up. But since it has a part one, part two, I'm guessing it's going to be a lot longer. So we will see how it goes, but let's jump right in. Oh, interesting. A Slice of Sweet Serenity of Days Long Lost Part 1. That looks like Jacopo and Morgana, but Morgana that's not scarred. The midst of our festival is behind us, leaving only the hellish heat and none of the distractions. I'd lived here in the slums long enough to not be surprised by the chaos that came with us in season, but I never looked forward to it either, particularly the smells. Mostly human smells. The alleys were where the worst of it was, and there was no peace in our little peacekeepers group where it came to decide who had to patrol them. But even down here in the foulest dredge of society, there were small pockets of light. Hidden spots where one could enjoy a breeze without worrying about catching a surprise whiff of rotting flesh. One such oasis was a small graveyard, home to those forgotten souls who passed with no family or loved ones. It looked like a little more than scattering of rocks in the grass if you didn't know any better. And for the past two and a half years, it had been tended by a single young girl in the name of Morgana. Today is that almost every day since she'd come here, I headed for the graveyard. I'd been having trouble focusing recently. Ever since coming face to face with my feelings for her, I made rookie mistakes in training, which invited all sorts of teasing from Gratine. Give me a break, kid. You're even worse off than the day we met. I wanted nothing more than to clock him square in the jaw, but I knew he was right. I wasn't for myself. Of all the things, it was love that was throwing me off. I could hardly believe it. Though in reality, it was less the love itself and more the age difference that vexed me. Morgana was 11 years old, still a child. Fetch, she's still a child, yeah. And I was 21, an adult. Ugh! Ugh! No, it still hurts to hear it. <laughs> Clearly, I was out of my mind. Something was wrong with me. I tried to talk myself out of it again and again. But the more energy I expended on the issue, the stronger the feelings became. If I were to get closer in age, it wouldn't have been such an issue, so why? I had no answer, though. Only these feelings. And at the point, I had no choice but to accept them. 
I was in love with her, with a child barely half my age, no matter how mature she acted, and there was nothing I could do to change that. I knew at least I would have to wait until she was older to tell her how I felt. At least he's half sane. I could only imagine how terrifying it would be for her to have a man twice her size and age profess his love. It was out of the question. I needed to make sure she didn't feel like I was pres pressuring her into anything, because that wasn't what I wanted. Ugh, why does everything have to be so difficult? The closer I got to the graveyard, the more of a disaster I felt. Obviously, I was thrilled to be able to be with Morgana. That wasn't even a question. But my own priorities were quickly shifting from keeping the peace in the slums to caring for her. Thoughts of her had begun to consume my life, though I would never, I would never admit as much to her. It was the awareness that posed the biggest challenge. It changed how I looked at her, threw out everything I knew about her and how to act around her. And Morgana had clearly caught on to my recent uneasiness as well. The other day, after a particularly awkward conversation she had given me, this burning glare had said, You seem on edge. What foolishness are you scheming now? What are you fretting over, Jacopo? Just act normal. It's not that hard. Breathe in. Breathe out. Breathe in. Breathe out. Clear your head. I passed by a few makeshift graystones, searching for that distinctive tattered black robe. It usually wasn't hard to find, with it mostly being grass and rocks here, but I had no such luck today. Is she not here yet? Deciding to wait a bit, I headed over toward a tree for some shade, which is where I found Morgana, her head resting against the trunk. If you're gonna sleep on the job, at least go back to the brothel and do it there, I muttered under my breath, approaching the tree. Hey. No response. Morgana? But once I got close enough, it became clear I hadn't just stumbled on her slacking off. She wasn't so much leaning against the tree. Morgana! as she was collapsed in front of it. I scrambled over to her, dropped to my knees, and put my hand on her shoulder, causing her to topple forward, her head falling into my chest. She was burning up. Hey, stay with me! Oh, it's you. Her golden eyes glanced up toward me, empty and slightly bloodshot. She clutched her lips together, as if trying to hold back a cough. I just have a, a bit of a fever, a little sleep, and I'll be fine. Like hell you will be. We need to get you back to the brothel. No, I can't go back. Come again? No, I don't have time to deal with your stupid morals right now. I don't want to get anyone sick. They're doing their best. Aww. So she hadn't come here of herself but to protect the girls at the brothel. And you call me stupid? Jeez. Not a single person there cared about themselves or Morgana's safety. Not the girls and certainly not me. But she continued to insist I not bring her back. I bit my tongue, finding back the urge to snap at her. I wanted to say something nice or reassuring, but I was too irritated by her usual self-sacrificing nonsense that I couldn't. So can I take you somewhere else, then, as long as it's not the brothel? I lifted her into my arms without permission, but it was an emergency. She would understand. Although in her feverish state, she didn't seem to understand much of anything right now. With Morgana in my arms, I hurried home. I laid her down in my bed, soaked an old rag in cold water, and placed it across her forehead. It was all I had, but it was better than nothing. I'll be right back, I said, and then ran to the door. Next, I was out to the pub, where I, be where I had the barmaid get me some fruit and other light foods. And while I was there, I told a few of my peacekeeper companions about what happened, asking them to cover for me that afternoon. They laughed and teased, but all I was, concer all I was concerned about right now was getting Morgana better. Next, I made my way to the brothel. Maria was asleep, so I woke her up and explained what was going on. Thankfully, having known each other our whole lives, it only took a couple minutes to get everything out th uh, through her half-sleep head. She let out an exaggerated sigh, then said, God, that girl, she should know better than, the be than that by now. On my way out, Maria gave me a few pieces of advice and, set fresh uh, and a set of fresh sleepwear. With the clothes in hand, I rushed back home once more, the merciless summer sun pounding down on my sweaty back the entire time. That's the worst time to have a fever is the summer. I hate it so much. When I made it back, Morgana's breathing was fast and shallow, her eyes clenched shut in pain. The rag on her forehead was already warm. Peeling it off, she opened her eyes and apparently awake. Can you eat anything? She shook her head weakly. Then at least drink some water. If you don't have something, you're going to sweat it all out and wither away. Not that there's much time in that tiny body of yours to lose in the first place. I felt a pointed stare, but that was it. No witty retorts. It didn't look like she even had the energy to drink on her own. So I scooped up some water in a cup and brought it to her lips. It took her a while to drink even half the small cup. 
Now you need some rest, but only after you get out of that robe, it's drenched. Marie, give me some nightwear for you to use. You'll be much cooler in this. I held out the immaculate white gown for her to see. Clothes in the slums were always someone's hand-me-downs, usually several times over. Something this new was a rarity. I'm fine as I am, she said, turning her head away. Absolutely not, I snapped back. Just put this on, okay? Oh, I see. You're not comfortable changing with me in the room? All right, I'll be outside. Does that work? Oh, come on, say something. If you won't change yourself, I'll do it for you. You want me to rip that big, heavy thing off myself, do you? If you would, please. Yeah, yeah, I hear you. You'll do it with your... What? D Did she just ask me to do it for her? I want I want out. I want out of this, but I can barely move myself. Oh, right. Yeah. All right, fine. Well, since you asked so politely, my entire body suddenly froze up. I'd only said what I did because I was certain she would tell me no. This was not part of the plan. The fever must have really gotten to her under any other circumstances. She would have never agreed to this. Morgana hated showing people her skin, which was one reason she wore that heavy black robe in the summer, to keep her face hidden by that ridiculous hood. Keep your head, Jacopo. You're caring for a sick girl, nothing more. She's a child. Anyway, you're not so, so lost that you would have inappropriate thoughts about a child, are you? Repent repeating these words in my head like a mantra, I began removing the robe. It was even wetter than it looked and weighed a ton. Her hair was slick, sticking to the back of her neck, too. I would probably need to comb that out when, she, when I was done. My heart pounding at probably dangerous speeds, I set the robe on the floor beside the bed, doing everything in my power to look anywhere other than at her. I then pulled the gown down over her head, guiding her arms through the sleeves. But as hard as I tried, I couldn't completely avoid the sight of her pale white skin, particularly her chest, but not for any uncouth reasons. It was the cross-shaped scar there that caught my eye. Scars covered Morgana's body from the time of the Lord Baroner's captivity, and while the wounds themselves had healed, it was still a grisly sight. The deepest among them was a cross-shaped scar in the center of her chest, which seemed to embody the entire tragic story of her life. Seeing it filled me with unspeakable sadness and helplessness. Not to mention deep shame at the base thoughts that had threatened to cross my mind in the moments before. I wished there was something, anything I could do to show her that not everyone was out to hurt her, as much as the world may have made it seem so. I'm... Yanked back to my senses by the sound of her voice, I pulled the gown down the rest of the way in a panic. I was just making sure I got it right. Absolutely nothing inappropriate, I swear, I said. That was perhaps the least convincing excuse imaginable. She looked at me straight in the eye and then turned away. And then, in a voice as soft as a feather, she whispered, I'm sorry. You're sorry? For what? I don't understand you at all. Maybe she felt bad about imposing on me? Either way, she sure got me meek when she wasn't feeling well, huh? I chuckled to myself. The only thing you need to concern yourself with right now is getting better. Then when you are, you can tell me to go burn in hell for this, like the Morgana I know would. Don't apologize. Okay. See? This is what I'm talking about. I can't deal with you like this. I said with a sigh, poking, picking the robe off, off the floor and making my way toward the window. If I set it out in the sun, it'd probably be wearable again by tomorrow. Is there anything else you want from me? Believe it or not, I'm capable of showing kindness when someone's sick. So ask away, I'm at your service. Yeah, figured as much. Me. Huh? Leave me. Ah, right. You want some time to rest in peace? I under. Don't leave me. I stopped dead in my tracks and spun back to look at her. Had she really asked me to not leave her alone? Her? Morgana? I was pretty sure I hadn't misheard her, at least. Sure, I said uncertainly, then headed back toward the bed, taking a seat at the edge. The wooden frame creaked under the weight of the second body. Your... What? Your face is red. Did I get you sick? No, of course not. I'm perfectly fine. That's good. Organa's eyes were unfocused, like she was drifting between dream and reality. I doubted she grasped what was going on or anything she had said, and by the time tomorrow came around, she'd probably have forgotten everything. Which was probably for the best. I mean, it seems like convenience, but I, I don't know if you've ever had 
Have you ever had a fever that severe before? Because I have. I've had fever a fever once where I became delirious. I swear I've, I've talked about this before, but I, it, I, I don't think it's, I think it's been long enough. I doubt you've heard it. Um, I ended up having gallstones. It was a, a downside of losing weight really quickly. And uh, when that happened, I didn't realize what was going on at the time, but I would get these horrific stomach pains and break out into a terrible fever. It happened three times. And the third time was when I went to the hospital and we figured out what was going on. Um, but before I went and saw the, ho the doctors, I was in my like fevered sp state in my room. And I remember just being drenched constantly. It wasn't even like summer either. It was pretty, it was like spring. It was not, the weather was really nice. And I remember I was in the basement and like the coldest part of the house and I was sweating buckets. And I remember having, seeing things in my room that felt tangibly real. Like sometimes you can see like little fuzziness or maybe stars or something when you get sick, but this was full on like, I was looking out my eyes, but it felt like I was seeing in two different things at the same time. Part of me was seeing my room. The other part of me was seeing fictional characters from TV shows that I watched standing around me arguing about stupid stuff that had no impact or even, like it made no sense, it was nonsense. But it was like they were just standing around me babbling about random things that I, like, it was driving me crazy. I just was sitting there and I couldn't do anything and I couldn't make heads or tails of what was happening. I, part of me, a tiny fraction of me knew that I couldn't be seeing what I was seeing. But it was such a small part that at times I would forget and I would be like, I felt like I was in a sea of madness of was burning voices and, and like, like fever dream is like the word of the day for it because oh my gosh, like it's, it's terrible being in that state, having those types of feelings, going through that. It's, it's horrible in every way you can imagine. I wouldn't wish that on anybody. So yeah. And I know that there are gaps in my memory there too, times when I just didn't recall anything. So it's real, it happens. You just have to have a really, really bad fever for it. I didn't want her to remember me looking like this. I reached over and took Morgana's hand in mine. She didn't protest. And in fact, it seemed to help her relax because less than a minute later, she had drifted quietly off to sleep. The sight of her soft sleeping face in the sunlight was indescribably beautiful. No matter how hideous anyone else may have thought it. I remained there, her hand in mine, for a while longer. And as I said a little prayer, may I be the one to take these hands and guide them into a future. Sucky, sucky, sucky wish. <sighs> Alright. That is a lot of story that we've covered. I think I'm going to stop here. It's a bit of a shorter episode, but at the same time, that's a lot. And I don't want to start the next one going that's going to go a lot longer. <sighs> yeah, that was a really sweet story. I think a good place to end, too. But yeah, we'll, we'll continue this next time. Um, it's just really interesting to me to kind of think about and consider all these, like, experiences that I've had. And, like, I've gotten it's interesting because like i don't feel like i get more sick than most people but this year i have i mean i had a kind of unlucky where i caught like a nasty cold and then i caught a fever and then i caught covid like with maybe like a week or two between them and so it feels like i've been sick constantly this year it's just been really bad luck um but it feels like when i do get sick like it tends to be bad like, I've had probably more surgeries than uh, most people do. Even, like, 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 heck, I had more surgeries than most people by the time I was in my, like, in my late 20s. Like, heck, in high school, I had, I, th I think I've had, like, I had two broken bones and three major surgeries before I graduated high school. So before I turned 18, um, I was on crutches for nine months because I shattered my knee. That was one of the surgeries. Um, I had a, um, fatty tissue buildup in my eye. It's not, not like a, it, it's not, it's, it's not a tumor and it's not a, uh, uh, what's the other thing that's typical and not, it wasn't a cyst. It was, it's a glitch where fatty tissue kind of just collects and starts stacking on top of each other. 
for no real good reason. Like it's essentially what happens when you store fat in your gut and your arms, but it was doing it in my eye socket for some reason. So we had to get it removed because it was like putting pressure on my eye and slowly growing. So like that was fun. Uh, and then I had appendicitis. That was the great one. That was in, uh, that was the school. I rode my bike to school that day. And I remember thinking that morning, I was, I was like, it kind of hurts when I pull my leg up. And then slowly it got worse and worse. And then eventually it turned into like, it went from like, from like a like a stabbing pain when I coughed to feeling like someone was inserting a hot red hot dagger in my gut and twisting it every 30 seconds and that was in a major emergency surgery too I've had so much stuff happen to me <laughs> yeah and that's not even the end of it like I've had more since then but like that's all the stuff that happened to me before I was 18 oh then I, I did break my wrist too but that wasn't a surgery related one that was just me being a like I think I was nine years old when I broke my wrist so yeah I've had my share. I've had my share of things happen to me. So yeah, I can experience and share that with you guys. But anyway, sorry about all the rambling. It's just kind of reminiscing. Anyway, hope you guys had a great time with me today. That was some really lovely stories, beautiful music, very short recollections, but I'm guessing we're looking at two different packages of like short stories where I feel like we started with like the complex long ones and then it kind of went down to the shorter ones. And now we're doing a second packet, which is like part one and two of like of this, a, a slice of sweet serenity, like one, two, like, and then we're going to get shorter and shorter as we get down to a cup of kindness. And then we'll go back to that last, the remnant recollection. And then we're ready for reincarnation. So thank you so much for being here today. Thank you so much for spending your time with me on the channel. It's always a pleasure to have you here, especially thank you to the patrons. You guys are amazing. I owe you guys a patron cast. I actually think I'm going to record that pretty much right after this. So I hope you guys are ready for that. I'm looking forward to spending this time with you. And as always, it's a pleasure having you around. Thank you for your support and your love and your comments and everything. And until the next video, watching me, I'll see me next. I'll see you there. Thank mm -hmm. you.